Um, so what we're going to talk about today is about bridging the divide between the patient and the doctor. Um, and we're going to do this by looking at how doctors think and how you can try to understand how they think and then maybe start questioning them and kind of involve yourself in the medical decision process. So when I started to think about this and the topic that I wanted to do, there's a lot of potential opportunities to have a lot of blood and gore and everything else and tell you crazy stories. Um, and if you want to know what is in the bottom right hand corner, you can talk about it later. But uh, I, uh, I decided to stay away from this just because of the kind of uh, concern for the, the topics itself. So we're going to avoid that. We're also going to avoid uh, any research, um, particular vice research, uh, because I tend to think that people think that their research is very interesting, and then when they start talking to other people, then they don't necessarily think it's that interesting. Um, so uh, we're going to avoid that as well. So what we're really going to talk about tonight is kind of an insight into how doctors think. Um, and the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because there's a big movement in medicine. It should have happened 50, 100 years ago, but it's called shared decision making. And basically, this is what you would think it would be, but it's, it involved patients in their own decision making. Um, and to kind of ask them their goals and their preferences and what they would like to, you know, have, what they would like to do as far as treatment is concerned. Um, so this is the kind of general outline. So we're going to do a little bit of a case um, and kind of get you in the, the mindset of looking into this. Um, and then we're going to go into three different steps of the kind of decision-making process. And this is particularly kind of geared towards the emergency physician and kind of what we do on a daily basis. So the first thing is going to be forming a differential diagnosis. Um, and then we're going to go into ordering tests. And then the last thing is going to be looking at uh, making therapeutic decisions. And through all of this, we're going to kind of involve you and figure out kind of how you can be involved in all of these processes going along. So here comes the case. Um, and just before that, so an ED physician works, you know, a little over a thousand, maybe 1,200 1, hours per year. Uh, we see about 1.8 to about two patients uh, per hour during that time. So we see a lot of patients in a year. It's about 2,000. Over a lifetime, we probably see about 50,000, 60,000 patients before we all burn out. Um, <laughs> and so, so I, the particular case presentation that I showed was chest pain. I think reason because there's a lot of public concern about getting chest pain. Another thing is it's a very common ED presentation, and also it's very complex about how you kind of manage it and how you go forward with it. Um, so what I want you to do is kind of envision yourself. So you're, this, you're here tonight, but you, for the last three days, you've had some chest pain, you've been coughing, um, you've had a little bit of a fever. Um, and you look to your friend and he, you're kind of complaining about your chest pain and he's like, you should go to the emergency department. So all of a sudden, before you know it, you're in the ambulance and you're headed to the emergency department. Um, so we're going to move from here. So what you do is you made it to the emergency department now. Um, and the first thing you're going to do is you're going to get triaged to the emergency department. You're going to get put into a room and then the doctor is going to come in and start asking a lot of questions. And what they're doing is they're doing this next step, which is forming a differential diagnosis. Um, so what is a differential diagnosis? It's basically a list. Um, it's a list of diagnoses that we kind of keep in our heads or try to keep in our heads as much as possible um, about what potential cause you have for this chest pain. Um, in the emergency department, we tend to keep the bad stuff right at the top. And those are the things that we kind of want to knock off the list. Um, and then all the common non-life threatening things we kind of keep towards the bottom. Um, and those things get knocked off too as we're doing some tests and everything else. Um, and then the next question is, well then, how do we form this differential diagnosis? Well, a lot of it comes from schooling, so you kind of learn about different pathologies and everything else, and you kind of learn uh, a little bit about how to form it. But then there's two other competing theories about kind of how we manifest this in our brain. Uh, the first one is I like to call it kind of the gambling method. Um, it's, mu it's, much more, it's much more complex than that, but this is how it works. So every time I ask you a question when you come into the emergency department, if I ask you if it's left-sided chest pains or right-sided, if you have nausea, shows it, all of those are associated with a particular cause of having a, a diagnosis of, say, a, a heart attack or a blood clot in your chest. And what I'm trying to do is trying to get a sense of, do you have lots of one particular level of complaints, or do you have another particular level of complaints? 
And then I try to kind of add up those all in my head. Um, and then I kind of combine those into uh, kind of a sense of what are your odds of having a heart attack? What are your odds of having a blood clot in your chest? What are your odds of having a muscle strain? And that kind of situates where my, my diagnosis is along the way. So in all actuality, though, this is not how we, we do anything with our thinking. So <laughs> this is how we do our thinking. So what's the next letter in this series? <laughs> Wonderful. OK, so you made your first diagnosis. <laughs> okay? So this is the reason why. So I see thousands and thousands of patients all the time. So they come in with a combination of symptoms. They fit into a particular pattern. Almost everything we do is pattern recognition. And it's been shown across the board with different experts in different regions who pattern recognize. And it's very interesting when you start moving through kind of residency and then you move up into being an attending physician and how kind of well you see that all of a sudden you just see the diagnosis and it's there. Uh, and so this is how we do it. I can't tell you why I came up with that diagnosis. It just was there. And that's because over time I've developed enough patterns with enough patients to be able to put people in different categories. Um, so that's really how we do the di diagnosis. So the next section is how as a patient can you kind of be involved in this process? Um, and the main thing is to provide as much information as possible. Don't, please don't be the patient that sits down and just doesn't say a word and we'll tell you, oh, I have a little bit of chest pain, but I have nothing else, no other complaints at all. You've got to give us information because all of that information is going to be able to, to develop into a pattern. Um, and so that's kind of what we're looking for. The next thing is question your physician. If I walk out of the room and you don't know what's in my differential or the top of the two or three things I'm thinking about, it's a bad sign. It means you don't have a clue what's going on as a patient about what the next tests are going to be or anything else. So please ask the physician, you know, what do you think about? What are the possibilities that I have? And then the last thing is express your concern about what you think you have. Because if I walk out of the room and you were concerned about a heart attack and I have heart attack's not on my differential, then we have a problem. Um, it may be that you have no chance of having a heart attack, but that at least hasn't been expressed to you. Um, so you need to ask those things. Okay, so moving along. So now we've kind of got this differential. But the unfortunate thing is that there's a lot of possibilities. People, you know, come in with chest pain, they can have 10 things on their differential. So we need to order some tests to kind of narrow down that differential. That's what we're going to do next. Um, so in the emergency department, it's a little different than kind of other environments. Um, one reason why you order your test is to find the diagnosis. But I would say a lot of the time what we're really doing is we're excluding serious diagnoses. So I want to make sure you don't go home and you don't have a heart attack. You don't go home and you have uh, kind of a rupture of the aorta that goes down in your chest. Those are the things I really want to make sure of. If, if you go home and I don't really know what you have, but I rule out all the bad stuff, I'm kind of happy. That's, that's a good thing. <laughs> okay, so when you order a test, this is kind of how it works. So on the left-hand side, you have your different, these are all your potential diagnoses. You have heart attack, blood clot in the lungs, tearing in the aorta, all these things. And I kind of ranked them a little bit uh, just in a kind of a list. So you can think about, I'm thinking most about a heart attack in this situation, and least about a muscle, muscle strain. And then I order an EKG. So you get your EKG back, you see this, and then my differential changes. So I've got a little bit of a piece of information. And based on that piece of information, some of those things on the list start getting moved down, some of them start getting moved up. And again, a lot of this, again, is pattern recognition. It's not as, you know, kind of a systematic approach as this, but this is kind of how it works. So now I'm thinking, well, maybe you've got a blood clot in your lungs. Maybe that's the most likely thing. So I've got to order some additional information. Because everything else hasn't really been knocked off the list yet. So I order some labs. You get the labs. And so now, now it's looking like pneumonia is a little bit more of a chance than anything else. The blood clot in the lungs is still a possibility. And then the other things are starting to get smaller. There's a less probability of all those things happening. So, but still, I'm to the point where if I sent you home and I thought you had the chance of you having a heart attack in the next 30 days was 5%, that would be a bad thing for me. Um, so, you know, it's still not low enough from a risk standpoint for, to allow you to go home. So I need to order a few more tests. Um, and so I order a chest x-ray, I take a look at an ultrasound, and we get all these things, um, and then finally we kind of come up. So now I'm pretty much set, I've got a, most of the information, i narrowed down to a, a pneumonia as the diagnosis. All the other things to let you know are still possible, because they're just not probable. They're very, very low probability. 
So when we say you have a diagnosis, we're not 100% sure. It may be 95% sure, but it's good enough in that particular circumstance. So how can you be involved as a patient about this with the ordering of the test? The main thing is just to know about the risk and benefits of tests. Most tests are pretty benign, other than getting you know, a blood stick or some blood test. Uh, most tests are benign. There's a few tests that are probably are not as benign. So getting CAT scans are not, not benign. You get a certain amount of radiation. You get a little bit of contrast usually in the, with the uh, CT that causes, can cause some problems. So those are things to ask when you're getting these kind of more invasive tests. And hopefully your doctor will talk to you about that. Um, and then don't be afraid to say no to a particular test. If you think it's going to cost a lot of money and you're really not concerned about your chest pain, then just say no. Uh, but these are things to kind of think about when you're, when you're talking to your patient. Okay, so the last thing is making therapeutic decisions. Um, and this is where I think you can be probably most involved with your decision, uh, with your physician and what kind of decision making. So we've got our diagnosis of pneumonia, but you can think about, you know, having a diagnosis of a blood clot in your lungs or a lot of different things. And, you know, the next thing to discuss is what are your goals of care? So. You know, what if, if I'm an 85-year-old and I've got terminal <coughs> cancer, my goal of care might be completely different if I have a pneumonia than somebody that's 45 or 50. I may well just want to go home, um, and that's perfectly fine. But if you don't express that to your physician and you don't involve them kind of in that decision-making process, then you're probably gonna, not going to get the care that you want. Um, so that really needs to be expressed as a kind of final end when you're making those decisions. Um, and then you should also know a little bit about risks and benefits of a particular therapy, and that should be expressed by your physician, but you should also inquire about those things. So particularly like for a case where you have a blood clot in your lungs, so one of the main things is we try to thin out the blood so that that blood clot kind of gradually gets resorbed. Uh, but the bad thing about thinning out your blood is that you have a risk of bleeding from, you know, you're going to have a GI bleed, which is gastrointestinal bleed or some other thing. So you've got to be aware of those bleeding risks. And then you need to make a decision. Do I think the risks are okay versus the benefits of you know getting this treatment? And that's kind of how that's kind of how it works. Um, so what I would say is for general and for the take-home points for this is provide as much information as possible during the initial encounter that will help us kind of form a differential. Um, and then be very proactive in both you know questioning your doctor, asking them questions about what are they thinking about for the differential. Um, you know, what are they thinking about? What tests are going to be ordered? And then kind of set your goals and objectives uh, during during that plan. Um, and then you know, work with your doctor when you finally kind of get to the final steps of the evaluation. Ask them questions. Develop a plan moving forward. Um, and so, what I the last thing I want to say is, uh, if you ever feel ashamed of coming to the emergency department, you have some butt abscess or something else that, that is particularly bad. Um, do not be ashamed. I have seen everything. I have seen, I have seen the worst in people. I see the best in people. Um, it is a wonderful place to work. Um, so you know, if you have something that's serious, feel free to come in. We're not going to be